Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to join us as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. It's been a really big week for the moon. Most of you know we just passed this incredible milestone. Yes, woo! Um, this last Saturday. And I'm really honored to have a chance to introduce a fantastic lineup who's going to tell you about moonshots, past and future. I'm Ariel Ekbla. I'm the director of the MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative. And to kick us off today, we have Dr. Maria T. Zuber, the Vice President for MIT, Vice President of Research for MIT, and Joey Ito, Director of the Media Lab. Thank you so much. OK. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, glad you're all here. So um, as Ariel noted, we had an incredible anniversary um, this past week of 50 years since human beings first uh, walked on the moon. And, uh, and, you know, now we're talking about going back to the moon. Um, we're teaming with uh, Blue Origin as part of their Blue Moon program to take a payload to the moon. So watch for uh, that opportunity, and we hope that many of you will propose to be a part of that and compete uh, on it. Um, but I want to turn the clock back uh, 50 years to talk about John F. Kennedy's speech, which I think you're going to see in a few minutes. And uh, so John F. Kennedy gave that speech, and it's an incredibly uh, famous speech where he challenged Americans to land on the moon and return safely within a decade. And at the time, we didn't have the faintest idea how to go to the moon. Okay, so if you were one of the first astronauts, you had a 50% probability of living through uh, your uh, mission because we had uh, launched two vanguards, didn't work the first couple of times, the next two worked, put an astronaut in the third one, so the, the probability was 50% at that point, and yet we went, okay? And, um, and so while this speech is incredibly fa uh, famous, um, this was just the first of many speeches. So last month, um, there was an event at the JFK Library commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing, and throughout the day, um, we saw clips of many JFK speeches talking about the importance of going to the moon. And, um, and what we had during that era uh, was first and foremost leadership. Um, and, and second of all, we had uh, the desire to learn both science and technology. So interestingly, um, the, the JFK um, event was all panel discuss discussions, except for one part where there was a talk about climate change being our next moonshot. Okay? And, um, and you, you know, there are so many people who think about climate change and says, it's a global problem. It's so difficult. How are we going to do it? Well, the fact of the matter is, we didn't know how to go to the moon either. And that didn't hold us back. And I see no reason why we should be held back on the climate change issue. So as we, we think about the role of space today, um, I want to raise the issue to you that uh, space um, is going to be an important uh, aspect of us getting a grip on the climate problem. And uh, all of you, I ask you to think in the back of your mind about how you're going to con contribute to this, because it's going to take all the smart people to do it. But let me tell you, I think we can get it done. Mm -hmm. And I'll turn it over now to Joey. Yeah. So. I'm not the space expert, but 
I've been thinking a lot about what it was like 50 years ago. So 50 years ago, there were hundreds of police and students on these streets protesting the Vietnam War. Uh, 67 was the summer of over 500 race riots in the Detroit riots. It was also the summer of love. And it, it was a really interesting moment where you have JFK and then after that, uh, Lyndon Johnson, who brings both parties together to attack both this moonshot, but also really going after all of the problems that we had that are in really weird ways very similar to yeah. the divided uh, uh, nation, divided world that we have right now, the wars and things like that. So there's this really interesting uh, historical symmetry that we have, but our problems are different, right? Our problems are now climate and the earth. Um, and like Maria said, I was just at this conference where people were just talking and talking and talking about climate. But it was clear that no one had the solution. And as Maria said, I mean, no one really knows how we're going to figure this out. But it was clear that something had to be a scientific breakthrough. And so, so I think that's one essential piece. I think the other thing when I think about 50, so I worked at, uh, my first company I worked at was called Energy Conversion Devices, where we developed the first nickel metal hydride battery, the first amorphous solar cell. And the company is bankrupt, right? It's, it's, it's gone. And most of the people who worked on energy 50 years ago, so we actually had a thing that our CEO drew in 1950 that showed the hydrogen economy. It showed photons, batteries, hydrogen. And the problem is I, I ended up getting what I call energy fatigue because I, I was the, on the board of this company until it was um, basically wiped out um, in the 90s. And I think a lot of people who work in energy we were talking about this 50 years ago. It's not a new problem. And I think one of the things is, I don't want to be ageist, but the professors in this field, the people who have been fighting the energy wars, they're all kind of pooped out. And I think one of the th other important things about sort of celebrating the 50th anniversary and then thinking forward is we need to we need a kick in the pants, right? I think that the people who used to care about advanced nuclear, about solar energy, it, it's gotten kind of old, and I think it needs a, 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 a new generation to come in. And so I think part of the other thing about thinking about the next moonshot is how do we bring a new generation of people into this um, conversation? And, and then how do we re reframe it, right? Because it was like about putting a man on the moon, and now I think we really need to think about this uh, um, in, a, in a much more pluralistic way and thinking about all of the, the, the diversity and thinking about Earth. And so, so I, I do want to take this as an opportunity to kind of reset our energy um, restack our boosters and uh, take off for the next phase because this time I think you know if we screw up it's not just half the astronauts that are going to die it's, it's half of us are, are going to die too and I don't want to end on a non cheery note but but I think I think that I think you know all of our lives are at stake so um, we can do this we can do this okay yes. all yeah. right Thank you so much, Joey and Maria, to have kicked off the day for us. Our next speaker is going to be Stephen Rothstein. He's the executive director of the JFK Presidential Library and has these troves of both historical and modern impact from the JFK legacy. He is on his way here and stuck in traffic in the tunnel. So I'm going to talk to you for about two to three minutes. And what I thought we would do is just maybe field some questions from the audience about what is MIT up to, what is MIT Media Lab up to in the context of space. Give you a quick overview of the space exploration initiative here at the Media Lab. We are trying, with the incredible advisors like David Newman from MIT Aero Astro, Katie Coleman from NASA, retired NASA astronaut that you'll meet later, Maria Zuber and Joey, to build the artifacts of our sci-fi space future. So if you think about the things that you see in Star Trek or Star Wars, we have this incredible moment here at MIT to begin building those really rigorously and flesh out what human life could look like in interplanetary civilization. Some people would say this sounds very far out. Why is this important when there are so many other critical, more existential threats to humanity? And something that Joey told us last year really has stuck with me. One of the reasons, among many, that we go and explore space is it helps expand our circles of awareness. There's a fantastic quote from Bill Anders from the Apollo 8 mission 
when he was describing being on the way to the moon, they were on a mission for the purpose of exploring that celestial body, he looked back, saw the Earth, that classic photo of the Earth rise, and we see the Earth from space, and said something along the lines of, we came all this way to discover the moon, and what we really discovered was the Earth. And so there's a certain impressive ability and a certain need to be able to get that kind of perspective when you've left the Earth and can look back and see how beautiful and fragile it is, which I think some of our director's fellows spoke really beautifully to earlier in the day as well, that need for perspective. If you're more on the practical side and you don't want to hear about philosophy of why we care about expanding perspectives, there's a lot to be gained from the rigors of space and how we then design for artifacts that are useful for a much broader swath of the population here on Earth. So I assume many of you know about NASA spin-offs. Can anybody name one of the many, many NASA spin-offs that came out of the space race and came out of modern um, space work from NASA but is now really broadly used? David, I know you can have a couple. Sorry, Velcro, yep, Velcro. Say it a little louder. Computers. So MIT is very proud to have worked on the guidance computer for Apollo 11. Not all of computing came out of the space race, but yes, a really large um, chunk of rigorous prototyping for computing did. Um, hmm? Memory foam, that's another famous one, yeah. LASIK, I recently learned, that some of the um, precision docking movements and um, damping of movements that are required for really strong and, and precise docking in a space context have been used for um, controlling the surgical movements in laser eye surgery in LASIK. And now we're thrilled. We have Stephen Rothstein, who's absolutely a champ, walking in behind you as we speak. Give you a moment to catch a breath. Enjoy yourself as you take your way to the podium. Any final thoughts or questions about some of what I just shared? Any other NASA spin-offs that people can think of? What do you say, Chili? Say again. It should be working. Oh, as a kid, I know in school a lot of the kids talk about being astronauts, but they don't know how to become an astronaut. So I've been thinking, how will we be able to teach the Mars generation how to become astronauts? I think that's a fantastic question. You should be part of that answer. Um, I think all of the creative people in the room can have some contribution to what is it going to take for a different astronaut experience on Mars, and that's a great question for Katie Coleman, who's going to be up here later. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome the executive director of the JFK Presidential Library, Stephen Rothstein, up to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry I was a few minutes late. I was at another event. I truly apologize. But this is a very special day. It's a very special year, and there is literally MIT is, was at the start in the center of it at the beginning, and it is today. So it's really a pleasure. And some of your speakers that are, you'll hear from in a few minutes, we were honored to have speak at the Kennedy Library um, last month. What I want to do, though, is start with a very briefly um, go back to President Kennedy when he spoke at Rice University on September 12th. Um, and so if we could cue the Rice speech, and we'll listen to just a short segment of that for a minute. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. We shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, 
fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this and do it right, and do it first before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. It's always a hard act to follow President Kennedy's remarks. But just to put it in context, um, there are 80% of the people alive today, including most of you, who were born after the Kennedy administration. So when John Kennedy said that speech, the word computer software had not been invented. There was no such thing as software. That no college, not a single college in the country, had computer science as a major. Some of the alloys needed for that capsule had not yet been invented. There was no one in government or private sector who not just said we could get to the moon, but showed pre the President Kennedy that there was a plan. Um, in fact, the only capsule that had been up was Alan Shepard's, which the capsule actually, if you want to come to the library, you can see it, it's there, had been up for 15 minutes. In, um, and so we were talking about, he was talking about going, you know, a quarter of a million miles away. So it was lit, the literal moonshot when you think about that. Not just was it technologically challenging, but financially. When NASA started in 1958, it was a, the first few years when John Kennedy was first uh, uh, inaugurated, it was a hundred million dollar agency, small by federal standards. And the first 17 people that the administration interviewed to run NASA turned it down. It was a do-nothing agency. They didn't know what the mission was. They weren't sure where it was going. This, what about the moon? Would it be manned or not manned? None of these had been resolved. So John Kennedy heard about this. President Kennedy heard about it. He says, I'm going to interview. Who's the next person? Uh, and it was this guy named Webb. And so President Kennedy interviewed him which was actually very unique for a president to do kind of a sub capital le level at that point. But convinced, and, and, and Webb went to Washington telling his wife, says, I don't really want to do this, but the president wants to meet, so I have to go meet. Um, and President Kennedy convinced him. And thank God he did, he did a great job in terms of that. President Kennedy worked on the public awareness in terms of why do ticker tape parades? To kind of get people's hearts and minds. Why give colleges computer science uh, scholarships, some of the first grants came from NASA because he needed computer science people and he, let's do it now so in four or six or eight years they'll be ready. Um, and then in terms of the money, we went from a hundred million dollars a year to billions of dollars a year and over 400,000 people in, in NASA, public, private sector working on this including some of the folks at MIT and some of the folks at Draper and others that, that did a great job. So John Kennedy had a vision, but what his brilliance was in galvanizing people, bipartisan um, uh, business and universities. You know, why is NASA in Houston? Because A, it was a great place, but B, because there was a right congressperson on the right committee that would have an influence on dollars, and he wanted to get their support too, as well as the vice president. So he understood all the tools to make it happen. At the John F. Kennedy Library, and if, if you haven't been there, I encourage you to come, we're trying to keep that spirit alive. We had some of your amazing folks that are here today, they were fortunate, we were fortunate that they spoke a month ago, and it's on our website, uh, space, uh, uh, the, the Space Summit. We also, so we've had this year 10 different astronauts in the course of the year, and highlighting work. And we've also done educational work and things like that. But I'm going to show you another brief video that gives you one of the things that we've done. It's an augmented reality version of Apollo 11 that I encourage you to, to join us with. So for the other video, please. Good morning and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. We're here in Boston, Massachusetts today to celebrate a very special event. 50 years ago today, 
the Apollo 11 mission was on the launch pad. The Saturn V rocket carrying the first humans to touch the moon was ready to go. And it really was um, about inspiration, wasn't it? Was, it was, It was about one man's vision for what could happen and then pulling it all together. John F. Kennedy gave this speech and had this idea, and it was sort of this thing, this seemingly impossible task that we were attempting to accomplish. They didn't think this was gonna work. They didn't know that this was possible. And maybe it made other people think, well, if they can do that, what can I do? Absolutely. Right? And then maybe that's, that's what it's all about. That's what it was about 50 years ago, and that's what it's about here today. It was a moonshot. Absolutely. And today we're gonna do it again, except through augmented reality. So we've actually got the full scale length of the rocket in front of us, and you can play all kinds of different games. We also have a really special guest with us today. We've got Dr. Lupo. He is a big deal. Kind of a big deal, honestly, yes. yeah. You said you wanted to be an astronaut when you were a kid. My dream job, you know, we all have, yeah, a lot of people want to be veterinarians and doctors and stuff like that. I wanted to go to space. NASA. I called you an astronaut. Let's do it. Are you allowed that? Like, is Call that okay? Me. It's a once in a lifetime experience and to be able to recreate it, it's pretty magical. Let's do this. We're gonna get the countdown. All the phones up in the air. There's 10, nine, nine eight, eight Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. There it goes. The Saturn V rocket straining against the bounds of humanity. This is people coming together, what we can accomplish whenever we work as one. This was amazing. This was beyond what I ever could have expected to feel it. To see it, it's just amazing to be here at the JFK Library. Is that much more special? So you can download that, it's free, JFK Moonshot. But before I sit down, I wanna ask all of you to think about what is your moonshot? What is your really big idea? And we have actually a site on our website at JFK Moonshot, that we're encouraging people to submit their big ideas, because we think our country has to come together again and think of whatever the next big idea is. So again, thank you for all that you're doing, and I look forward to listening from the back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steve. Oh. All right, as we prepare to get the stage swapped out for our panel, I'd like to introduce to you Dava Newman. She's the former Deputy Administrator of NASA and is the Apollo Program Professor of Astronautics here at MIT, a fantastic mentor to the Space Exploration Initiative and also my PhD committee member, one of my members. And thank you, Dava, and if you can then introduce the panel. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Great to be here, everybody. We're so glad to be here. Well, it's about my favorite thing in the world to do, talk about Apollo, talking about the moon and uh, getting onto Mars, which you're gonna hear a lot from our great uh, panelists. So they're gonna um, come up here, but we have a great diverse crowd from you. Uh, yeah, you guys come up and join me, I'm lonely. I'm David Newman, the Apollo program professor, so I'm from MIT. Alex McDonald joins us from NASA. He's a chief advisor, an economist. Uh, we're gonna ask him about what the plans are, the very current plans for uh, Moon and Mars. Uh, Dr. Katie Coleman has uh, previously been introduced, MIT alum, uh, deployed Chandra X-ray telescope, and a great friend, and thanks for joining us, Katie. I have lots of questions for her as well. And Jesse, I'm so glad for, to have you join us. Uh, career at NASA and in the private sector, and I'm um, going to ask her about uh, policy and uh, anything you want to tell us about. But we'll start off with Apollo. So um, can I have this Apollo in real time? I have my rocket. I have Steven's rocket in AR here. I have too many gadgets. <laughs> if you haven't been, I think the nice folks behind us are going to. Oh, am I supposed to? Glad we didn't get feedback. That's Katie. Oh. We actually, we we'll have talk about who's now a stamp. We are gonna. She's on a stamp. I oh man! Stamp. Spoiler alert! <laughs> spoiler alert! That's coming up next. <laughs> and um, so, where were you Saturday, uh, July twentieth? Oh, cool! Yeah, this is awesome. This is actually fifty years ago to the second, because this is day nine of Apollo eleven. This is day nine. We've landed. The crew's back safe. We're gonna get all of our moon rocks back. They're gonna, you know, they're just getting checked out. So all of the science photography, um, all of the other photography, and all of the audio realms, because as people have mentioned, we know, we know the three astronauts, but what about the 400,000 people that were behind them and propped us up? That's how we do 
moonshots. So this is Apollo in real time .org. I just wanted to kind of give a, a shout out to the NASA folks who put this together. It's all the science, it's all the photography, all in one and in real time, which is pretty awesome. We're going to jump right into our panel because I can't wait to talk to these guys. And we'll have plenty of time for audience questions as, as well. So you guys get your, get your questions ready for us, please. OK, Jesse, can I start with you? Sure. What's, what do you think is hard about us getting to the moon next? What do we have to figure out? Well, I think that we tend to talk a lot about the engineering challenges. And of course, they are great. Uh, but I also like to draw the analogy between engineering challenges and socio-political challenges. And I think that we often don't give ourselves enough time to ask questions about how we might design collaborative frameworks uh, to make sure that we see peaceful uses of space uh, per, uh, persevere into the future as we send humans, uh, send humans there, but also how we enable cooperative structures that will reflect back to the Earth and support the, um, the sort of climate change and science that we need to see happening here. So it's not that the socio-political challenges are more challenging than the engineering. It's that they're getting a lot less attention. I think we tend to assume that we can wait until we've solved all the technical stuff, uh, and then we'll just you know put an LLC around it and you know <laughs> call it a day. And I think there's a lot more to it. Do you think we have any good examples of? socio-technical models, global cooperation that might, might serve us well? Oh, well. Small steps that we've taken, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the world is full of a lot of uh, diverse examples. Um, I think the main thing for us is looking at each of the uh, specific projects we undertake as, uh, as not homogenous and uniform, but as needing their own sort of specific treatment. So. Uh, when we look at, for example, early activity on the moon, I think one of the questions is going to be uh, to look at having a small group of, of companies or governments who are going there and what kinds of cooperative frameworks make sense for, for small numbers. So we're not talking about you know, um, the entire international community of actors uh, in that particular case. We might be looking at five or six companies and how they're going to interact. Yeah, it makes me think of uh, lessons that we learned with the Mars rover, mm -hmm. with having virtual reality where it used to take a bunch of scientists all over the world most of their day to decide what the rover was going to do the next day. And once they established a VR environment where they were all you know, literally looking at the same rock instead of going, well, don't you think that's going to be too steep? And, oh, it's so far. And then everybody is looking at the same thing and meetings that took most of the day were like 15 minutes every day, Le leaving those valuable scientists to actually do science and not deliberating. So I think that's, that's interesting example. what we can do to get ourselves on one page. And bring everyone with us, I think for all of our missions, because we want to bring all of the public, all of you, but we want to bring everyone. Okay, Katie, so I have to ask, everyone wants to know, uh -oh. what's it like up there? <laughs> and why? What's your favorite part? <laughs> I know you want to go, what's your favorite part? <laughs> um, I mean, it's been actually really wonderful hearing about the anniversary and living through it. And I think I spend most of my sort of waking life trying to help everybody understand that all of us can achieve the things that we want to do. And I feel very lucky to have had this job. I loved it. Um, it killed me to leave it, although I find that I'm busier in the mission of exploration now that I've left NASA. That's not a comment on NASA, but it's actually about the mission. It's about what all of us are you know, on a mission. And so I love that we're reliving every second of Apollo because it's making people realize, oh, these were like normal people taking real steps, um, except up there we do not take steps, and that would be my favorite thing. <laughs> Those of you that knew me any time, like before I was like, you know, 18, know I was never the most coordinated in junior high gym class, <laughs> and I am, you know, a space gymnast now. <laughs> I'm the, I won't actually say I'm the best in the category, but seriously, I loved, um, I loved living in a place where you fly from place to place, and life is different, and every idea that you have about, well, what if we did it this way, 
is one you'd never would have had down here. Mm. And so I really, I loved flying everywhere. Uh, if you look at, uh, on the web, Splitting Hairs in Gravity is a video that's out there. It's a little tiny video that Karen Nyberg made because she has really long blonde hair. And you can literally take one hair from your head, pull it between your fingers, and use it to like push off of something and fly <laughs> across the whole space station. So it's magical, but it gives you ideas about how life could be different. Mm -hmm. And just having you up there, so a uh, follow-up, since we already had the spoiler alert, oh. tell us about your new stamp. So She's recently come back from Ireland. So I, I, bring you, I, I tell you this about the stamp and bring it, and maybe we can show it. S Steve, now, now I want my picture. Um, <laughs> this just came out last week. It's a commemorative series of stamps in Ireland. They wanted to feature four people that had, were of Irish-American descent, and it's Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Eileen Collins, who I flew with when we launched the Chandra X-ray Observatory 20 years ago, about two days ago. So we were up on a short mission, and actually 20 years ago, I was still in space on STS-93, having already launched the Chandra. Two but women, I'm, first woman commander. That's true. So, yep. First woman commander, and uh, which from whom I really learned a lot. But what's significant to me, the reason I show everybody this who will look, is that it's not really about me. It's about that we, the, the planets aligned, that the time they decided to do an Irish American series was with the commemoration of the moon landing. So these stamps are just going to have more of a life than you know, if they were April Fool's Day stamps or whatever. I mean, they're really going to have a life. Um, I think many of them are going to be stamped on the moon landing day. And there's two women and two men and three people out of four that are alive. It's not so often that you have people on stamps that are still living, can speak, and can make you realize that this could be you. And so just the fact that those two faces, it's not about the fact that one of them is mine, that a bunch of girls are gonna grow up thinking that they could do anything. So I, and, and, and it takes art, it takes storytelling, it takes imagination, and it takes bravery, like you were talking about, you know, people have to treat every sort of task that they have with what more could they do, what more one step could they do. And the people who were making these said, let's have women and let's have people that are still here to tell the stories. And Alex, we're glad you're here too. We, mm -hmm. we also <laughs> invite men. Um, and uh, so my dear pleasure to, to turn it over and and ask Alex McDonald some questions. I had the great pleasure to work with him at NASA headquarters and as deputy. Good thing is he's there as a civil servant doing amazing work and he's really the best person we can hear from to talk about the moon and Mars, the strategy going forward. Apollo 11 inspired us all, I was five years old, but now he has an amazing job to really, let's put that strategy in place, a real solid strategy about looking forward. That you're all the Mars generation. How you doing? My can I bring in anyone and say that every time I want to know anything about this subject, I and call is, Alex. And as an economist, I mentioned before, because not everyone's an aerospace engineer, scientist, or even policy. So that's a really important message for everyone that we need every single discipline. That's how we get even moonshots done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you. That was very kind as an introduction. Um, you know, thinking about the strategy for getting back to the moon and getting onto Mars. I, I actually can't think of a better place to start that conversation than with the uh, anniversary of Apollo. Um, this past week, there was this absolutely incredible event, which was uh, a sound and light, fantastic celebration on the Washington uh, DC mall, where for the first time, an entire narrative was projected onto the Washington Monument, and half a million people came down at night to DC to sit on the lawn and watch the story, not just of Apollo 11, but the story of how uh, our species uh, emerged out of the caves. Uh, the Lascaux Cave paintings is actually how they start that narrative. Uh, then through the invention of writing, through the discovery of electricity, to the point where we evolve a global technological civilization and a nation that can actually muster the efforts of its people to achieve something that previously had just been myth and legend, taking ourselves to 
the celestial object of the moon. And what was so amazing about that event was that people just basked in it and felt so united on that mall. It was one of the best feelings I've ever had in Washington, D.C., which may tell you something else about D.C., but um, <laughs> it was just so freeing for everyone who was there. And that was what was so special about Apollo, and I think actually special about space exploration in general. It speaks to this deep chord in all of us to go and explore the unknown, right? And not for profit, right? Not for necessarily geopolitical competition, although that may be why the funds are provided for this activity uh, by the nation, but that's not why Katie went to space, right? You didn't go to space to compete with people. You wanted to go and be part of the global civilization that is exploring the cosmos. And it never stops. Right, and it never stops. And so getting back to the moon is something that we're now focused on very seriously at NASA. The goal is to get uh, American astronauts to the lunar surface by 2024. Uh, it's been very clearly stated that one of the core parts of that is going to be to have the first woman on the surface of the moon. Um, but we don't stop at the moon. The goal is to go to the moon to learn what we need to know about how to operate far from the Earth for the periods of time that are going to be relevant for getting onto Mars. Uh, and that's going to mean living on the moon for at least weeks and months, the kind of minimum amount of time you can imagine living on Mars in the kind of quickest Mars mission. Um, the longest we were ever on the lunar surface was about three days. Apollo 11 uh, was less than a day. I think it was 21.5 hours, right? So uh, learning to live for exploration uh, relevant durations on the moon is going to be hard. Um, and I think what's really exciting is that now we're doing it with more international collaboration. We're doing it with private sector collaboration. And we're going to be putting all this together over the course of the next five years to get to the moon, and then over the course uh, of hopefully not very long after that, putting it together and getting to Mars. And that's not the only moonshot we can think of, but I think it is a relevant one, right? The idea that once again, we are going to dare to do something incredibly challenging, but that it has a real significance, going to Mars, searching for Martian life, and then returning people safely back to Earth. Um, my favorite quote, and I'll just kind of end my comment with this, is that uh, Arthur C. Clarke said that when people see humans standing on the ridge of the Vallis Marineris, a canyon system on Mars that extends the entire length of the United States of America, then once again, humanity will be destroyed in happiness. And I really like that idea. And I'd say that's a good enough reason to go to Mars by itself. <laughs> that's great. Thank you all. We have some students I see in the back, and we have some people standing up. There's some chairs right here, so I am going to break in. I'll uh, be back. But if you're standing up or if you're students, um, I can't see you because you don't feel free to come up in the front. Take a one-minute break. Come on up and join us, folks. We have some seats up here. want to make sure that... We have a good long 45 minutes to keep interacting. <laughs> so I want to make and we're sure going to take the can, questions. We're going to take students. So you might want to be in those. There seats. you go. Come on up here, students. We're not quite ready for questions yet, but I'm just trying to get people moving. There you go. You guys, come on up here. Come join us so we can be intimate. There's a few chairs. If you're quick, you can grab one of the chairs. And then there's a lot of floor space right up here for you to come in. So nice. thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. So you guys, come on. Come forward. There's a lot of carpet space up here, and then we, can, then we can see you, and we'll be able to hear you when you ask questions. Come on, gentlemen. You can come up here. Come on. Come join me. <laughs> we're, we're really friendly. Right in the front. <laughs> there you go, right here. Just, just hang out here. You're not going to block anyone's vision if you just plop yourself down here. There's chairs, but you can just sit on the carpet. Yeah, just sit on the carpet. It's pretty awesome. comfortable. Awesome. Yep. All righty. Good. Come nice on in. Job. Okay. If you guys from the back want to come on in, come on in. This is your opportunity. Lots more questions. It's more fun this way. Yeah, exactly. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. We're glad you're here. OK. Can you continue? So all right, I have to ask you a little bit about the technology, right? This sure. is MIT. OK. So um, what are a few of the showstoppers? You know, what do we really need to focus on and invest? Again, we've heard Kennedy 
you know, President Kennedy's speech. Uh, we didn't know how to do any of it. And as Maria said, we had to invent heavy lift launch. You know, we had to have the capsule. We had failure, a major failure, Apollo 1. Uh, we lost three crew. That was really tragic, but, but guess what? At a failure, we become better. We become a lot better. So we had to get all this technology. Today, we don't exactly have that capability. We're working on our technology. So I want you guys to talk about your favorite piece of technology that needs some, some work to get us back to the moon and Mars. Yeah, I mean, I think right now, one of the key pieces is going to be a lunar lander. Right? So one of the reasons we think we can get back to the moon uh, relatively quickly is that a lot of the pieces are already in development. Right? We have the Orion spacecraft, which is the uh, analog to the Apollo spacecraft to take the crew out to lunar orbit. Uh, we also have a heavy lift launch vehicle under development, the Space Launch System. We have the ground infrastructure already established at Kennedy Space Center. When the Apollo program started, none of that was there. Right? Kennedy Space Center, of course, wasn't the Kennedy Space Center yet. Um, and so we have so much infrastructure to build on, but we don't have, until very recently, a lunar lander in development, the equivalent of the lunar excursion module, the LEM. And we've now just come out with our very first solicitations uh, to start industry building these lunar landers. So we're really on the way already. Great. Katie, do you have one? I think about the human systems in terms of the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> you, some of you laughed. But, um, you know, people say, you know, well, how come we haven't gone to Mars yet? And I haven't been on the space station for a few years, but when I was there, the bathroom and the system that recycled the air and recycled the water, and Alex, you can tell me if they're doing a lot better, but they, they break more than once a month, one of them. And that's not ready for Mars. And it's not because you know, people didn't design them with enough heart or, or thought. It's because it's a really different environment in microgravity, and we're learning lessons, and we're learning how to do those things. And what excites me about solving those problems is that if we have them solved to go and be living on the moon um, and, and then going on to Mars, it means that we have actually solved a number of really compelling and valuable Earth problems. I mean, recycling air, recycling water, learning how to grow food in places that it's hard to do that, and enough fluid physics to have a bathroom that really works. I mean, those are paramount problems and challenges down here on Earth, so that's exciting to me. And yeah. Jesse, I happen to know you have, a, you have a bit of a background in computer science as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, how does that fit in all to, to this, to our future <laughs> well, plans? I mean, actually, I was going to riff off of what Katie was saying, sure, uh, because uh, there's a, a really kind of iconic uh, challenge that we haven't even tried yet, which is mammalian reproduction in space. And we don't even know if uh, humans can gestate another human being in space. That, that hasn't happened with, with rats. It hasn't happened with th that I know of. Uh, well, in the radiation challenges. Yeah. Right. I thought right? we reviewed yeah. radiation. No, so we I think to there's space or radiation. You know, is a to talk about the like, core challenges that we're facing, mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a really big one. Um, and then, of course, the, the challenge of what's called in the, in the space world ISRU, in situ resource utilization. So how do we live off the land when we go to the moon and Mars? Uh, that's something that we have a lot of ideas about, but the science uh, isn't quite there uh, for us to know exactly where to look or exactly how to build the mining equipment that we might need. And so there's a lot of details. There's a lot of questions that we need to answer, and that takes time and iteration. And, and I think that there's things that, like in terms of 3D printing, and we're, we're thinking about... Like, what do we need to really bring to the moon? And what could we build there, yeah. given what we find there? And I think somebody like me that learned about 3D printing when they were 50 is able to have a certain number of ideas. But you, who grow up thinking it's normal to think, I'd like to have this, I think I'll make it. You know, those, that's why the, the game, the sort of playing board is going to be very different, is that um, I think Joey Ito and I had this uh, discussion about synthetic biology. You know, we needed to teach kids about this because we have sort of ingrained ideas that first you have to do this and probably this is hard, and you don't have those ideas, and that's actually how we're going to get there. So uh, we have a lot of basalt on the moon and Mars, so you have to make your maker. It, this is literally the transformer, so the, the challenge to the students is make the maker bot for the moon and for Mars, right? <laughs> so we can't bring it all with us, so that's a, that's a big ask, but I'm sure yeah. we have enough smarts in this room. But it's also important to, to remember that. that 
for the first missions, we may bring everything with us. We may right? to the we moon, may, especially when we get to exactly. Mars. You have to be we may bring completely autonomous, us, right? Uh, we didn't make things on the moon in Apollo, um, and I think the first applications for things like 3D printing is going to be in sparing for yeah. different pieces for the deep space transport that goes out to Mars. So you can make a real mass difference, and, and limiting your amount of mass going to Mars is vitally important to keeping the cost down, to keeping the amount of propellant down, uh, but pe things are going to break, just like Katie was saying, and that means you got to repair them, that means you got to have spares. And if you have to keep spares for two to three years of a mission, then that eats up a lot of mass. And that's where I think actually we're not that far in terms of current 3D printing capabilities to think about that sparing philosophy. But it's, that's a really challenging um, project in itself to do the statistical analysis to figure out when something's going to break, what can you afford to have less spares of. I mean, a lot of that analytical work is still yet to be done. It's been happening. It's been happening, and right now I can give a shout out to uh, Mars 2020. In one year, mm -hmm. we're launching the next big rover, mm -hmm. to, to Jesse's point about ISRU, in situ research, utiliz resource utilization. We're going to make oxygen on Mars, first planet. We're ever going to make oxygen for the first time, and that's, that's the MIT MOXIE experiment that, that's already all buttoned up, delivered to JPL, and it goes uh, next year as a mission. It'll arrive in 2021 because it takes us eight months to get there. So I'll, I'm going to ask a few more questions. You guys getting your, your uh, questions ready. But I'm going to switch a little bit. And um, I just actually, I love, uh, I love the, the name of our panel, To the Moon to Stay. <laughs> yes, we're going to stay. We can talk about that. Um, but most importantly, from the moon, with love, with love for humanity. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jess and say, let's, let's talk about that. Uh, let's talk about the emotional, the personal uh, connection from all of exploration. And we might also, and reflecting, the, the moonshot reflecting back on the Earth. Interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the going off of your comment about Mars, actually, I was just thinking we often hold the moon and Mars as kind of either or. And, you know, in the space community, uh, often there's the moon people and the <laughs> Mars people. And where do we go first? And, um, and who's right? And, and the same, I think, um, uh, sort of dichotomy exists between the Earth and the moon, especially these days, as we become more aware of, of the urgency of, of climate change and of, of fixing the problems that we have here. And they're not just climate change problems, they're also political problems, they're problems of scale uh, and coordination on, on Earth. And, uh, and so when I think about, it's a little bit of a riff on your question, but uh, the kind of the meaning of space, and it's also, I mean, you talked to this as well, um, I think this, this um, kind of playing them off of each other, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's not an either or choice. Um, and somehow I think that space often gets uh, uh, described as uh, something that is an either or choice when we don't talk about other forms of kind of advanced science and intellectual exploration as an either or. So if I think about biology or chemistry, uh, it's not that we would choose to either solve our problems on Earth or uh, do material science. You know, we, we would do both, and we would sort of naturally say, well, of course, the material science will probably inform uh, solutions to our problems on Earth. Uh, but we often, uh, we somehow, I think, maybe because space is territorial, I don't, you know, space is a physical place, so it's easy to think about it as either going or not going. And, uh, and so I really, I'm interested in, in ways of thinking about space that don't don't make it an other, that don't that don't treat it as some other place, but that relate it back to the Earth as as a kind of more unified system. Katie, what do you think? To the human um, aspects. I've been interested in, in say it again. The human, yeah. Talk about the human aspects. Aspects of we watch President Kennedy's speech, right? I don't know, but I almost cry every time. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, Such a great you know, speech. that's again, it's just the best that brings out the best in people. It's incredibly emotional, you know. So I don't think we have to have hard skins and think about this. Really, yeah. this can really move us. So, mm -hmm. and, and there's something, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at our friend from the JFK Library in that speech when he says, you know, we we choose to do these things not because they're easy, because they're hard. We're going to accept these challenges. We're unwilling to fail. And there's a line after there I can't quite remember, but it's it's basically in Hopefully, these things will be the basis of collaboration between nations, mm. and and I see that is you know that's what we're doing right now. And 
it's interesting that you talked about space in this physical way, and I, I've been answering some questions lately about, you know, there, everybody thinks about the next 50 years and things like that. What will, be, what will be humanity's greatest achievement and those kinds of things? And I realized that, to me, if my fist is the earth, you know, we thought that here's the earth and then that's space and it's a place that other people go. But now we've figured out how to go there and as someone who's been there, I realized that it's, it's a continuum. It's always been part of who we are. Mm -hmm. and, and how far out you go, whether it's to the moon or to Mars or the edges of the universe or whether you're a Chandra scientist, you know, studying black holes, you know, very far away, um, it's all our neighborhood. It's all the place that we live. It's a continuum. And one of the ways I think to share that is, you know, modern communication and better and better mm -hmm. video and storytelling and ways to share. Um, in, in your, uh, where's Ariel? Her last panel from the Media Lab, one of our astronauts came and we don't get to hear each other talk very much. It was Tony Antonelli. And he said something that very much surprised me. He said, we have done all of you a huge injustice. And that is that we talk about the view from you know, what it's like, but we have not communicated what it feels like to have that mm. view. And here's a pretty straight ahead engineer kind of guy. And I, th I really I was impressed by that. Right. So I think we have to work at ways to do that. Yeah. And your VR way to experience Apollo, mm -hmm. what you talked about on the mall, I've heard about mm -hmm. from others. Right. I mean. So we, yeah, we have the tools, mm -hmm. and we just have to point them in the right direction. Motions, the love, yeah. exactly. I love uh, Mike Nassimino says this as well, and it's a you know, true story. It's in his book when he looked after Apollo, was, I mean, it was in a Hubble, Hubble space prepare. He looked, and it was too beautiful. He turned away, hmm. you know, with a tear in his eye. That's how emotional, that's how beautiful. And he said, wait a minute, no, wake up. i got to look. <laughs> but that's how all-encompassing it, mm -hmm. it can be. You know, we call that the overview effect. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it makes me think of a couple of things. One is, uh, in addition to the event on the mall, there was uh, an event at the Kennedy Center uh, that the National Symphony Orchestra put on. And you want to talk about kind of uh, coming back from the moon with love. The most amazing moment for that night for me was a song sung by Neil Armstrong's son and granddaughter. Wow called Flight of Fancy that they'd written, and it was not about their uh, father and grandfather going to the moon. It was about the love that they saw uh, in his heart when he flew gliders, of just being free in an engineless plane, soaring, uh, catching the thermals, and it just filled the Kennedy Center with just one of the most wonderful feelings. And it reminds me of kind of Buzz Aldrin's uh, kind of uh, statement, which was that, you know, essentially once he got there, it was like, man, they should have sent a poet, right? Mm. Because he didn't feel adequate to describing the sense of emotion that just overwhelmed him. Um, and of course, he's you know, done actually an incredible job actually subsequently to explain to humanity kind of why it was so important. And of course, uh, we think of another uh, astronaut, Alan Bean, who of course was so moved by this experience, he became a painter, right? And so what I think is so amazing is that something uh, inside us kind of gets transformed by these otherworldly experiences. And what's exciting about the future is I think more people than ever are gonna have that opportunity. And I'm really excited to see what's going to happen to humanity as more and more and more people start to have that personal transformation through exploration and travel into the cosmos. Transform hopefully our mind, our hearts, and that hopefully goes a little bit full circle in this discussion. Maria and Joy were here, and uh, again, back to, back to Earth. You know, for sure, a moonshot, there's multiple, um, getting out, but uh, all of our exploration, I say, always just teaches us more about ourselves, ourselves on, on Spaceship Earth. We're all astronauts, so if you don't know how to be an astronaut, we're all astronauts, I'm here to tell you, because we're going pretty fast around our sun right now. So we're all, you know, having this amazing <laughs> journey. We're all astronauts, and then again, but, uh, you know, what's your passion? You know, what's your big moonshot was, was put out before? Uh, mine's getting people to Mars and uh, trying to save the planet. Uh, that's, that's worthy of some time. You guys want to say yours real uh, quick, a, a moonshot you want to throw out there, and then I'm going to turn to the audience next. 
I think mine goes back to the first uh, comment I made about finding new ways to coordinate, uh, to coordinate groups of people that give them more of a voice in the systems that they live in. So I'm actually about the boring next steps. <laughs> like I, I mean, I think that um, it kind of goes back to what Jesse said about each of us having you know, something that we can do. And I think that if you left with anything, and, and other folks might have suggestions after we do moonshots, but you know, what is the thing that you can do that can change the way other people think about their abilities, their ability to contribute, or the solving of a problem right then? And for me, you know, I mean, I happen to have a you know a high presence just because of the job that I have, and so doing a PBS thing where. You know, they end up for asking me for a comment about all the different kinds of people who made Apollo happen, and I and I start talking about Katherine Johnson, the mathematician, and Margaret Hamilton, the woman who coined the the word software engineering, and on and on. And they said, well, you know, we'll be showing Apollo footage and back you. I said, let's show Margaret and Catherine. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. And absolutely. you know, and they're and they're like, well. We have to have, do you have photos? I go, I have photos. They go, we could have this afternoon in good resolution. I go, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, and so it's like this little next step or instead of having me on some show, why don't you have me and five little girls that don't look like me? And so it, it's having the bravery to ask people to do hard things for a cause that's bigger than all of you. And, and so I urge you to think about what are the things that you can sort of speak up about and, and make happen because that is how the moonshots that we're talking about will be achieved. And um, to end, you know, my, my moonshot usually has to do with if we've done all these amazing things in space, I'm really excited about what it means for people and their health and their ability to um, be inclusive one, of one another down here on Earth because if we don't have inclusive teams, we're not we're not going to do any of the things that Alex talked about. None of them. Yeah, I mean, as a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C., I'm not sure I'm allowed to have dreams. Um, <laughs> Dream away. <laughs> <a bureaucrat. laughs> um, but in all seriousness, um, you know, one of the reasons I, I work at NASA is that it is um, a dream to see NASA still fulfill the role of inspiration and discovery and exploration 50 and 100 years in the future, just like it does today. Because if it can do that, if NASA can be an institution, it's only 60 years old, right? 61 years old this year. But what happens if NASA's institution that is 350 years old, right? Uh, what will that have meant for us, and how will NASA's existence as a symbol and an institution continuing to progress at the frontiers of science, technology, and exploration, that is a dream, right? We are not guaranteed that. That's really important to remember. Um, we have NASA because the people of this country pay their taxes and they want some of those taxes to go to technological investments in the nation, right? And that was not a thing that existed, right, prior to these kind of Kennedy-like moments. Of course, it emerges from the Eisenhower administration, but it reaches the scale of social impact under the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. And so it really is actually a dream to see NASA, for all of us, continue to be a global leading organization that stands for science and technology and international cooperation. Excellent. What's on your minds? We're opening it up to you all. Please tell us who you are. Oh, throw, we have this nice media lab square microphone that we throw in it. It's soft. Is going some? Go ahead. Hi, how does this work? Oh, Ooh, okay, I see how it works. <laughs> awesome. All right, uh, my name is Julian. I'm a rising sophomore here at MIT. And my question kind of concerns private space companies, like uh, you know, Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, Blue Origin. And it seems to me that a lot of these companies are synonymous with the billionaires that kind of are behind them, whether you know, it's like Elon Musk, Richard Branson, um, Jeff Bezos. And so my question is, is there a fear that space will similarly cater to the ultra-rich? How do we address um, how do we make sure now that space development doesn't end up reinforcing the same inequalities that we see here on Earth? Yeah. Great question, Julian. Who wants to take it? 
I mean, how long do we have to talk about that? Yeah. I mean, that is one of the really important questions that I think we have to think through as a society. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of my time researching the economic history of space exploration. And when you look, for example, at the large observatories, um, for example, the Harvard College Observatory that was actually had the largest telescope in the world in the 19th century, well, who funded it? Well, it was wealthy individuals, but they funded it collectively, and the idea was that you could publicly use that telescope. Um, that changes by the late 19th century and early 20th century when it becomes kind of individual, what we would now call billionaires, funding these telescopes. Um, NASA, of course, is not like that. It is a public institution, right? And as a result, it is... Uh, I often think about who the stakeholders are of NASA, right? People kind of will often try to use business logic to uh, think about how to manage NASA. Well, the reality is the stakeholders are all the representatives in Congress, right? Your representatives. And that is a very unique function in the world, right? That is not how the Chinese space program is organized, right? There is not that kind of democratic mechanism for ensuring that NASA uh, funds programs and runs them in manners that are commensurate with society's desires. But what I'll say about the specific billionaire uh, element of the current programs is that, frankly, to achieve these goals, we need whatever resources we can get, right? Um, we can either increase the amount of money that we pay for space exploration through our taxes if we want to achieve these, achieve these large goals, or we can partner with private entities. Um, to this day still, though, SpaceX's primary source of funding is NASA. Um, and that's the reality of where we are. At the same time, we want to see a flourishing of private capabilities. And as I've kind of said before, you know, this is the balancing challenge. How do we ensure that our space exploration programs both uh, serve public ends, if public dollars are being used to support them, while also allowing individuals to explore and spend their funding in ways that are commensurate with individual liberty, right? And this balancing problem is not a new balancing problem, it is the balancing problem of all of society and social life. Um, so yeah. Well, uh, just just to to play with that a little bit, uh, it is a balancing problem. Uh, but I think your observation is is also kind of ap appropriate in the sense that uh, the the balance of actors is certainly changing pretty mm -hmm. significantly yep. today, and so that has a lot of implications for who might be kind of out there taking uh, various kinds of first steps in the next decade or two. And, uh, and it's not just that uh, they're not necessarily governments, but they al there also might be a lot more of them. It might be that there are more and smaller actors. Uh, it is also the case that the billionaires can probably build infrastructure uh, or sort of set the stage in ways that small actors can't. So all of a sudden, the kind of systematic dynamics are a lot more complex. Um, and so I think a lot of people are asking the question that you're asking, and I certainly don't have that answer, but some, some thoughts and some kind of uh, conversations that, that I think are happening in the industry right now are that um, what we see are folks referring back to uh, something called the Outer Space Treaty, uh, which is um, a very lovely treaty. It's only about five pages. Uh, I highly recommend reading it. Uh, and it is sort of the defining and singular framework um, that we have in the international community for governing activities in space. Uh, and it's not very specific. So uh, in terms of what we can do now, I think it's looking at how we can flesh out the open questions that, that the Outer Space Treaty um, kind of leaves, leaves open and ask how we can actually um, kind of get to the specifics of regulating and governing ourselves in space when and if governments are not necessarily the, the only or the dominant actors there. I was going to say that Alex um, mentioned that we kind of need everything, and I'm more of a glass, I'm sort of, not more of a, but I'm a glass half full person. That, and, and some of these um, billionaires that fly on the Soyuz and come to the space station. And in my experience, and there's been about a dozen, something in that number, in my experience, every single one of them comes back here and tries to see what they can do with that experience to spread it around. And then with these um, private companies, it's really pretty wonderful to have this kind of diversity. Like when I was in, at NASA, I was in charge of supply, supply ships 
for the astronaut office. And I would tell people, you know, those SpaceX folks, sometimes they make a decision and they don't even have a meeting. <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of meetings at NASA. And it's very inspirational to us to be able to do things in a more direct way to kind of go, hmm, maybe we'll try some of that. And, and I think they learn some things from us. But more importantly, they can take risks with hardware that we can't take. I mean, we have some Absolutely. big thing happen on the pad. There's going to be an investigation. Things are going to stop. People are going to question, oh, should we be taking those risks? What if we failed? I mean, all those mm -hmm. things, right? And they can take bigger risks. And when they leap ahead, they bring us with them. And in every, every person that I've encountered in this business, even if they're talking about, you know, there's some profit to be had to acquire funding, they really all seem to be about a common mission of humanity leaving the planet, maybe from different points of view. Mm -hmm. Great. Actually, can I, Thanks. I sort of one other thing to sure. say. Sure. Throw that. it in and then yeah. just toss the ball around. We'll Great. Back to the hand in yeah, the back. Just, just a quick, quick one, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a bit tautological, perhaps, but I think sometimes what we see is a narrative that uh, it will, this future will be for the billionaires, and therefore people decide not to engage in the topic of what should the future look like. And so, in a way, I think the answer is by participating in the conversation, we will see a much wider diversity of perspectives, That's and great. those billionaires uh, will build off of that. Yeah, so great perspectives and all that. So the, democratiz the democratization of space is, is here, it's real. And so depending what part of space you look at, because we've been talking about human space flight, which is really expensive and, and hard and getting heavy lift, but guess what? Uh, you know, uh, all the communications, uh, you know, on your, on your phone that uh, you're dealing with. And so the democratization, every country is in space, back to the, uh, the treaty. Go to the UN if you're not familiar with the treaty. It's the United Nations you know, Committee on the, use, the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And uh, Daniel, what is it today? 85 countries, 120, 92. We have 92 countries who are part of that. That's 92 countries. So it's not that you have to be a space-faring nation. Not everyone today. If you can build a CubeSat, you're a space-faring nation. You know? So it, this democratization is real. It's happening. It's fantastic because it makes it very tangible and puts it kind of right in your hand. So it's great to see 92 nations saying, we're in. I think the, the so everybody there? have the beanie back there? Oh, great. Hi, I'm Chloe, and I'm going to be a sophomore in high school. Um, in terms of space exploration, what do you think has been our greatest failure, and what can we learn from it? Mm. <laughs> um, OK, you guys can think. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start. That's a, <laughs> that's a great question, Chloe. Thanks. So when I was at, at NASA, I gave an award for failure. Uh, because uh, people run around with this t-shirt that says failure is not an option. And that was great for Apollo 13. It was really important. But um, this, it's become kind of a risk averse. And so I wanted to make sure and say, no, no, we do our best. Actually, we fail, fail, fail. And then we get it right. So uh, I know about lots of failure. I, engineer, I fail all the time. What's a, one of, uh, but again, the kind of failing in order to learn something. So that's, I just keep it. You guys have your favorite, your favorite failure, the most important one. The, they're not my favorite at all. The um, shuttle accidents, mm -hmm. the um, Challenger accident, and the Columbia accident are um, uh, really, were really, um, I guess, important. Uh, people sacrifice, astronauts sacrifice their, their lives. The loss of life, life on those uh, missions is almost unthinkable. But, um, you know, they did it for us. I think the end result of those failures, we can't make a perfect aircraft. We can't make a perfect space shuttle. So we do our best. But when they sacrifice, to me, that's the ultimate sacrifice. When we have our astronauts have lost their lives, I wake up every day and say, guess what? You know, I have to do better. I have a better engineering solution because you're trying to always do better. And so that's, those are failures that, um, you know, have been uh, pretty critical in, in NASA's space program. Um, not, not telling not going to the trouble to tell all the stories. Hmm. Um, because so many, it, it takes so many creative ideas to solve the challenges that we have today. And, you know, to look a little harder to take, I mean, take more pictures. Take pictures of each other as you're in school and you're solving hmm. problems. And, you know, always show the team and value the people on the team. And it wasn't that, you know, I, I think about the Hidden Figures um, movie. You know, I say, you know, Katherine Johnson was a woman of color in almost every scene in the movie wearing a dress of color. And in a picture that shows her in a sea of white guys wearing white shirts and black ties, there's really nothing hidden about her. You can't miss her, right? But we did. And 
I like to look forward from that and just say that in every picture that you can take, whether it is, you know, Alex and 10 people that look like him, there's somebody in that picture that feels, everyone in that picture feels like there's something about them that people don't know, something that they have to bring to the table that's hard for them to bring to the table or they don't quite believe or they don't know. And, and so it's not just about color or race or gender, mm -hmm. it's, it's about what's inside you. And um, I don't think we're very good at telling those stories and it takes going to the trouble to do so. Do you guys want to comment? Don't, uh, we don't I, have to. Uh, yeah. Please. The thing that came to mind for me uh, is something around our failure. I mean, actually, I'm going to step back and say, similarly, failure is hard because I think there's two ways of defining failure. There's something that you don't do correctly, and then uh, there's something that you've maybe failed to learn from. And I think that's a deeper kind of failure and maybe a more interesting one to, to um, inspect. And I, as a post-Apollo uh, generation, uh, person, I think I feel a failure of uh, humanity to build off of the Apollo program and to keep some continuity happening. I mean, we almost don't know how to go back to the moon. Mm. Uh, we don't have the same technology we had during the Apollo program. We don't have the same capability. Sorry, we have the same technology, but not the same ability. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a huge loss. Like, if we could have even incrementally kept building off of what we did in the Apollo program, I think we'd be in a really different place today. Yeah. And I agree with all of this, and I'll just add one more, which is I think there's a kind of um, failure to be patient, which oh. is very common <laughs> in It's almost the opposite who, of what I was saying. <laughs> well, right, but, you know, in classic fashion, both can be true yes. simultaneously, yeah. right? Um, because I think there's a lot of folks who get very frustrated that we don't already have the moon base, right? Um, and yet the reality of how we got to the moon is a story that almost begins in the 1630s when the first stories about traveling to the moon and building machines that could do that start. And so that process of getting to the moon, you could either think of it starting with the Kennedy speech, which is one way to think about it, or you can think about it as a story that starts 300 years earlier, right? And people had to iterate on the idea and wait for conceptual knowledge to develop and wait for industrial capabilities to develop until that dream could finally be realized. And I think that's true for all of space exploration. The story of space exploration is not going to be what happens in the next 50 years or 100 years. It is, in theory, a story that has no end. It is a story that extends out into eternity, that's right? Great. And if you think about those timescales, it's really very challenging to then get frustrated and ask a change of direction of a $21 billion agency because something didn't happen within a particular time frame. So, uh, yes, uh, encouraging actually, patience. Uh, that, that first, uh, what, 300 years or so was, uh, was also mostly through art. Yes, I mean, absolutely. it wasn't the engineering, it was yeah. the, the visioning, it was the ability to, to construct these potentia potentialities yep. Yeah, the see yourself there. Yeah. We all have to see ourselves yeah. there. And if they hadn't done that, then the engineers probably wouldn't have, you know, actually gone and trying to solve the problem when they when they could. Actually, I brag about Deva all the time in that I think the first thing you do when you have a new project is you hire a graphic designer. Yes, look at this amazing artwork going on there because that's the story. Yay. Right, yes. we're up here. <laughs> but uh, shout out, shout out to our graphic <laughs> illustrator and artist. Because those, those pictures are what will stay for the, you know, for the time. But if people don't have a vision, how do they know that they should be on that team? It's not always visual, but there's a spirit, and that's where we actually yeah. come back to, you know, from the moon with love. I think there's something mm. that happens to all of us when we gaze at the moon. And as somebody who's been uh, separated from her family quite a bit, something that kind of comforts us in a way is that we all see the same moon. The same moon, exactly, from everywhere on Earth, right? And it's beautiful. Next question. Hello. Okay. Uh, my name is Joseph Zhang, and uh, I run a program called uh, Future Hack. And uh, we have uh, 50 students from 14 countries here today. Wonderful. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to um, kind of ask, kind of in this narrative, um, in, this, in this politics and narrative of, you know, kind of more isolation instead of more openness. Um, can you tell us about like how space 
uh, exploration and space tourism is going to open so much more opportunities for, for these young people. Yeah. Sure. I can, uh, I'll start, but you're not going to start with the fun. Uh, I want to know what 14 countries we have here, so we're going to do a race of the countries. Okay, we have U.S. here. Yeah, shout out. You students, tell me where you're from. Shout out your country. Japan. Hong Kong, cool. Hong Kong, Hong you, guys, Kong. you guys, if you hear them, shout them out. China. 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 Nepal. 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 Yeah. Germany. 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 Pa Do we have Pakistan? Pakistan. Pakistan. Canada. Canada. Mm -hmm. Poland. <laughs> Hungary. Turkey. Turkey. South Africa. Ah, South Africa. Cool. We're close to 14, not quite there. Go on. <laughs> oh, India. Oh, yep. <laughs> Do you have Italy back there? Good. So welcome. Welcome to everyone. So I love the question. Um, we can talk about it. It's, it really is uh, for everyone. It's global. You know, this is a, I don't think it's a space race anymore, in my opinion, because uh, the world is too connected. Not too connected, but we're very connected. <laughs> we know what each other are doing. And uh, because of the, in the spirit of love and doing things together, you know, why don't we try the model where we can all work together? You mentioned the, the rhetoric that's going on. That, I say uh, that conversation's cheap and easy. It's easy to say what separates us, but you know, we're all humans. We all come from the same place. And if we're 99.999% the same, then I th I'm very optimistic. I think we can get this done, and I think we do it together. Or you work on the things that you have in common or that you can mm -hmm. work on. Like with China, it's actually a little bit res it's restricted in some areas that we can't talk about. So I like to talk about the ones we can. But maybe Alex will have a more pessimistic view of that. <laughs> no, I don't even want to touch that subject currently. Um, the optimistic story, I think, is uh, that CubeSat technology has Ooh. fundamentally transformed access to space around the world. Uh, back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, people would develop space capability. You know, every few years, a new nation would expend significant amount of effort and have an, their first satellite. Nowadays, we're literally seeing, you know, new countries every single year build their first CubeSat. Personally, my favorite story that's going on right now is the all-girls team in Kyrgyzstan that is building their country's first satellite. Mm -hmm. We had that, an elementary school build their own CubeSat and sent it up. But so it's so, for everybody. It's right. for everybody in this audience, for sure. Right. And, and what's so amazing about that satellite project, and, and it's, again, it's to build a CubeSat. It's about this big. It doesn't do too much more than send a radio transmission. But the girls who are building that that satellite in Kyrgyzstan, it is creating significant social change because that is now a narrative that that country is telling itself about how that country does technology and advancement. And that's just one story. There are dozens like that. So I think anyone who's from a country that has never built their first CubeSat uh, and you have the ability to go back home, start an effort to build a CubeSat there. It is one of the greatest ways to actually democratize space access because it's not about just traveling into space. It's about learning the technologies to actually be able to take yourself and your community into space. Next up is the United Arab Emirates to Mars. Hmm. So a country that hasn't been in space, but it's a concerted effort um, with everyone working together, hope, is the name of the Mars satellite that the UAE will launch on a Japanese launcher, and it's going to succeed. So that's just another example. Everyone really is better when we all work together, and we want to see everyone succeed, so all resources in. I also think the uh, commercial world is kind of an interesting uh, element of this, where this might be a positive introduction or, or contribution from the commercial space in the sense that you have, again, this uh, actors that can collaborate in ways that nation states often can't, uh, whether they're you know, non-profits, for-profits. Uh, and I think that also means that we'll see more diversity, so different kinds of interests, different kinds of scientific interests, different approaches to conducting science and engineering. Uh, so it, it might be that there's a positive contribution from that, from that aspect as well. Um, right behind you. Hi, um, I'm Julie. I'm go a sophomore going into high school. Um, my question is dealing with Mars. 
Um, what's your opinion on the habitats that we're going to be building? Because there's multiple things that are getting researched, such as 3D printing habitats using concrete, which is actually called Martha is the name of the project. And then also I know there's another project that's being worked on using biological organisms and mm -hmm. making like a biological organism inflatable habitat thing. So I was wondering what your guys' opinion was on that. Yeah. Great question, Dave. I mean, that's, okay, I'll, that's your wheelhouse. Come on. You guys help me out. Um, so yes, we need habitats on Mars. And it's my opinion that you know, we don't take everything with us. So literally um, learning how to make construction out of basalt. So it's kind of like you know, concrete out of, out of Martian uh, regolith. That's Martian dirt. Uh, inflatables. I love inflatables. I'm here with Gabe. My partner kind of invented a lot of space inflatables for the moon because you can pack them up. It's origami. Right? We need habitats that are kind of like origami, so shrink them all up. Maybe we can take a little bit of mass with us, and then you get a big, huge area. You mentioned the, the biology. Katie before mentioned synthetic biology. We have, we're going there to search for life. It's not going to be our life, right? We're going there to search for life. But the people and all of our rovers and machines, we need places, you know, and actually isolated places to live. And um, uh, keep studying the biology and thinking about that, because how, how are we going to find life? How do we know we found life, organics, things like that when we get there? And biology and synthetic biology is just a big picture. It's just, you know, that's the technology going forward. My favorite uh, little story today is actually uh, one of my students is looking at, you know, boron nanotubes. Why? Because they might have radiation protection for, for humans. So it's a different way to look at it. Rather than living underground in lava tubes to stay away from the radiation, you know, maybe we can think about these interesting solutions, habitats, in the suits, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff that help, help keep our, our astronauts and, and people alive. So great question. Do you want to work on it? Um, not specifically. I want to ask for physicists, um, like, so working with black holes. Okay. Cool. So you have your own podcast. Look at this. Awesome. Astrophysicist. And she's going to help us with the Mars habitats. That's awesome, Julie. That's great. <laughs> yeah, just one thought on that as well is, um, you know, the, we don't quite know exactly what habitats are going to look like on a Mars, how we're going to build them. But one cool idea is that what if the habitat was actually a mobile habitat? So you could actually live in the vehicle that you actually rove around on Mars. Yeah. And what would be more American than having an RV on Mars that you could <laughs> rove around it? Or the moon. Or the moon. Circumnavigate. Right? So we're not going there to stand around. We need to look around. Yeah, the, the panel that you were on last week, I think, with uh, Fred Char Charman. I think so. Um, Fred made a really interesting comment about the habitats uh, that we saw uh, drawn during the Apollo era versus the habitats that we see in renderings from architectural companies and, and competitions now, and pointed out that uh, in the past there were these giant sort of communal shared spaces uh, and now if you look at a lot of the renderings, they're these kind of like individual pods mm. uh, with streets in between them and they're very, they're very sort of s separated spaces. And uh, so I think it's an interesting question how we, how we design those, um, those habitats will have an impact on the ways that we interact with each other, how easy it is to interact with each other, to communicate, to make dinner together, to watch a movie together. So I think it's a good question. We have time for one, two more questions. Who has the great cube back there? Yeah, so, uh, hi, I'm Christoph. I'm from Poland. I'm one of the guys from Future Hack Camp. And my question is, do you think that the space exploration should be more in the hands of governments or public or private companies, and why? OK, let's all take a quick shot at that, uh, both. Again, we can do both. We're smart people, so again, public-private partnerships. So, definitely think it's government's roles to um, invest in science and technology exploration. That's, that's the government role. So when I hold the highest for our government investing in science and technology, do you why? Because it's about all of you. That's education to me. That's about that investment from, from governments and uh, private folks. And we're trying to see if the business case closes. We want um, private folks to be successful, and definitely for low Earth orbit, for communications, services, these business cases seem to close, so uh, we're all in. Uh, yeah, not either or. Uh, and uh, again, the public, right? 
it's government, which is kind of public, and it's the private companies, but the public, we need, we need all of you. We need, we need all the, the kids in public to, to tell us what to do as well. I think that it's more about seeing long-term commitments, which that can come from government. Uh, it doesn't always come from government in the way that we want. And uh, political wins, I think, can undermine those kinds of long-term commitments. So um, whether it's from the private sector or from government, I think what we need to see are commitments on a sort of 50-year time scale. And a an example that was just used um, in another event I was at recently was looking at Alaska, the purchase of Alaska, and how, actually, I think this might have been Alex's example, mm -hmm. so sorry, I'm still... It wasn't one I analogy, <laughs> but it was at the same discussion, yeah. But it was, um, you know, the purchase of Alaska looked like a really bad investment in the kind of typical venture capital return time scale, so on a, you know, five or even 10-year time scale, uh, it didn't return very much value. Uh, but on a 50-year time scale, it's returned huge value. So how do we create constructs in whatever mechanism, government or private sector, to, to kind of have the patience to hold out for that 50-year time scale? I'd say all of the above. And, and to keep in mind, um, she Don Pettit, one of our astronauts, told me, yeah, I've been reading about, uh, you know, when we first had railroads crossing the country, and people would ask questions like, why would you do this? Like, what are you going to do when you get there? And what, what, what advantage is there to go there? And, and yet, you know, now it's, it's everywhere, and we think it's really normal, and we use airplanes and mm -hmm. things like that, too. And so, you know, always challenge your imagination. I mean, Public-private partnerships are, are hard, and government operations are hard. They're all hard, and yet they just take our imagination to kind of figure out that little way to make yeah. things happen. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I would agree all of the above, but I'll also just you know remind us that uh, private doesn't always just mean corporate. So uh, the origins of kind of funding at a public level in the U.S. for astronomy, uh, you could kind of argue that they started with an organization called the Cincinnati Astronomical Society, which was set up in the 1840s by a guy named Ormsby McKnight Mitchell. And he went to the city of Cincinnati, and he encouraged the people to fund the world's largest observatory by public subscription because he argued that because American was a democratic country and had no kings or queens, the traditional patrons of astronomical observatories, that the American people would have to fund the telescope themselves. And so they formed a private society. It wasn't the government. It was people by association coming together to work on a shared outcome. Right? They weren't there to make profit. They were there to create a capability for the city. And they didn't get the world's largest telescope. They only raised enough money for the third largest telescope, which was pretty good for Cincinnati in the 1840s. And as a result, for a brief period of time, the citizens of Cincinnati had access to the third largest telescope in the world that they themselves could use, not to do science, but simply to access the heavens, to mm. use it to look at the wonderful nebula, to look at the planets, right? And so that's a model that's neither corporate, nor is it a kind of federal government, right? So there's a huge range of ways to organize to achieve space exploration, and so it's going to have to be all of the above. Great. So uh, to the moon to stay, and uh, from the moon, with love, Alex, Katie, Jesse, thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for your great questions. Thank you. Now we are at the end of our afternoon. Thank you so much to all of you for coming and participating in our small way of celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. We hope you'll stay in touch. We large and hope to have a large community of space cadets that join us in a modern conception of Starfleet Academy. Please stay in touch. Please reach out and um, enjoy your time in the Media Lab. We're really happy that we had so many students coming today as well. Thanks. <laughs>